Good afternoon. Happy almost spring and welcome to our collaborative event between the Wonders of the World or WOW lecture series and the Sweet Thursday author series. Both WOW and Sweet Thursday are sponsored by the Friends of the Lafayette Library and Learning Center. And I'm Ellen Reinges, the volunteer coordinator for the WOW program. And I'm joined by Jeff Deaton, the Friends Sweet Thursday coordinator. Our program today features author Gabrielle Seltz, who will discuss her book, Light on Fire, The Art and Life of Sam Francis. And now I'm going to invite Jeff to jump in and say a few words of welcome from Sweet Thursday. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, I just uh, think this is a wonderful collaboration, our second between uh, WOW and Sweet Thursday. Day, and I want to thank and welcome Gabrielle to uh, the Friends of the Lafayette Library and remind our uh, patrons that her book can be purchased at uh, Orinda Books. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Before I continue, I'd like to let you know that we have recently activated the Zoom closed captioning feature. So hopefully this will uh, work fine. It's our first, first time with that. Oh, let's see. I'm hitting the wrong buttons here. I'm going backwards. Hold on. There we go. Friends of the Library are continuing to offer the WOW lectures and the Sweet Thursday author events online as webinars. We're in the process of scheduling new programs, and here are a few coming attractions. On Wednesday, April 13th at 2 p.m., WOW will host a speaker from the de Young Museum who will discuss the Alice Neal People Come First exhibit that opens on March 12th. Our next Sweet Thursday is tomorrow night at 5 p.m. when Sweet Thursday will host a webinar with uh, author Dr. Suzanne Coven who has written Letter to a Young Female Physician. And on Thursday, March 24th at 5 p.m., Sweet Thursday will host a webinar with author Naomi Krupitsky, who will discuss her book, The Family, which is a captivating debut novel about the tangled fates of two best friends and daughters of the Italian mafia. There's a coming of age story set in 20th century Brooklyn. And if you've missed one of our webinars or loved it so much, you wanna watch it again, you can visit our YouTube channel where you can find all the webinars we have been permitted to record. Not every author or museum permits recording. Our Friends YouTube channel can be found at tinyurl.com forward slash friends LLLC hyphen YouTube. And we will be recording today's webinar. To ask questions, please use the Q&A function on your computer or device. Please type in the question and at the end of the lecture, we will choose a selection of questions to answer. Since there are always audience members who may be new to the Lafayette Library, and there usually are, I'd like to share with you how best to learn and sign up for our upcoming lectures. There's two basic ways. One is to get on the weekly email list put out on Saturday mornings by the Library Foundation. Uh, they have a subscribe function on their website, and it can be found at llcf.org forward slash subscribe. Alternatively, you can visit the Contra Costa Library website, cccLib.org, and that has a programs uh, or events tab at the top, and that will take you to all the scheduled upcoming events. And since uh, those are scheduled uh, for 26 branch libraries, it may be overwhelming, but you can whittle this down to a more manageable number by using the filters on the left. For example, uh, branch or type of event or age group. And now a little bit about the Friends of the Library. For many, many years, we have sold donated used books to support the library. We have a retail store called Friends Corner Bookshop, which is located on the lower level of the library building at the back on Golden Gateway. And it houses over 15,000 affordably priced volumes. We also sell higher value books through Amazon. And with those funds, we support the Lafayette Library in a number of ways, including extended hours when the library is open on Sunday, which it currently is not, 
enabling the library to purchase books and related materials, supporting library programs for people of all ages from children through seniors. And that's not only our own programs, but also programs put on by the librarian. And we also uh, provide partner support uh, for uh, the Library Foundation, Lafayette Historical Society, and uh, for the facilities themselves. If you're interested in purchasing books uh, from the Friends to Support the Library, you can go to our website at llcf.org forward slash friends hyphen book hyphen shop. And there you can find the hours uh, of operation and the guidelines for donations and the all important button that takes you to the Friends Amazon store. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Gabrielle Seltz is an award-winning author who grew up immersed in the art world. She holds a special interest in the intersection of history, literature, art, and memory. Her previous book, Unstill Life, A Daughter's Memoir of Art and Love in the Age of Abstraction, received the Best Memoir of the Year Award from the American Society of Journalists and Authors, and was listed as a Best Book of 2014 by the San Francisco Chronicle. Gabrielle has been a contributor to The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, among other publications. As a teacher of creative nonfiction, Gabrielle has been the distinguished visiting professor of creative writing at St. Mary's College of California. She earned her BA in art history from the University of California at Santa Cruz and her MA in writing from the City College in New York. Thank you for joining us today, Gabrielle. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Ellen, Sherry, and Jeffrey, and the Lafayette Library, and wow, and um, Sweet Thursdays, and everybody who's here today. Um, so I'm <clears throat> sorry, my um, throat. I'm going to talk and um, have some slides about the book and um, break it up with maybe two teeny short readings. Um, and I'll stop about um, a quarter to three uh, for questions. Um, so Ellen, the only thing is if I'm not aware of the time, just interrupt me. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you all. Hang on, this is always fun. Um, Okay, slideshow, get slideshow, and play from start. Sorry, I talked to myself. Um, okay, so this book is Light on Fire, The Art and Life of Sam Francis, and it took um, six years to write, five and a half years, six years. Um, when I started the book, I had just finished my memoir on still life. Um, and I um, knew a little bit about Sam. There's every chapter of that book is centers um, around uh, an artist who either my father knew or who I later knew and a work of art. And so one of the chapters included Sam. Um, so I knew a little bit about him, but it turned out that everything I knew about him um, was pretty much self mythology and not exactly correct. So um, I found out um, some information about his real story um, right after I had finished my memoir. And I thought, oh, that was like the spark for the book. Um, so this is um, my dad actually getting married for the third time to, to his third wife. And over in the background is a painting by Sam um, and so what I knew about Sam was he was a character, an artist, and he used to come to the house and he'd given my, my dad had wanted to do a show about Sam at the um, Museum of Modern Art in New York, which um, didn't happen because my dad left the museum and came and started the museum in Berkeley. Um, but my dad had ended up writing a monograph on Sam Francis. And that's another picture of my dad in front of one of Sam's paintings, the painting called Iris. So I knew Sam as this, you know, global artist, Californian who went around the world and had studios all over the world. And um, like my father was married five times and um, really wanted to paint the heavens. So he was a big character and a, and a family friend. Um, and then I started to, um, I talked to his foundation and found out some stories um, about his childhood that really gave me insight into 
what was really going on with Sam um, and his background and what influenced his art and that had never been written about. Um, so Sam was born in 1923 in San Mateo. Um, this is a picture of him when he was two years old. His father was a math teacher, a mathematician. His mother was a homemaker um, and a Francophile. She loved um, everything French and tried to speak French to her children. Um, and she was also a pianist. Um, and he grew up in a very sort of idyllic childhood. He had a younger brother. Um, and, um, you know, even during the depression, his dad continued to work and maintain his job. But then when Sam was 12 years old, the family was on vacation. Um, it was 1935 and they were on vacation um, in um, San, um, San, Santa Monica and his mother became ill chest pains and they took her to the hospital and she, she um, the, the family was told she was too sick to travel and his dad had to go back to work because it was a depression and he didn't want to lose his job and the kids had to go back to school so they left her in the care of her mother and a few days later she died of a heart attack so Sam never saw her again and she was even buried back in Salt Lake City so he was not even able to visit the grave site. Um, and then six months later, his best friend, a boy named Roy Powers, who lived down the street, um, brought a toy gun, uh, um, not a toy gun, uh, a small little pistol to school um, and was showing it off. It was April Fool's and to all the other kids in school and trying to fire it and it wasn't firing. So they all thought it was um, broken and um, all the boys were in the downstairs bathroom and the gun um, was handed to Sam and it was handed to him in flat in his palm. And he would later say, I don't know if I accidentally pushed the trigger or if it, or if it went off by accident, um, but the gun did fire um, and the bullet pierced Roy Powers um, through the stomach and through his back and killed him. And so there was a big inquest and um, Sam's dad, um, who was from Newfoundland, decided to take the kids out of town and get them away from, from the drama. Um, and um, so they went, it was 1936, it was, you know, the Dust Bowl, it was the middle of the Depression, there were no freeways in the country, and they drove by car in an air-conditioned car from California all the way to the East Coast, and then took a boat to Newfoundland, where they stayed for the summer and they were in a place called Broad Cove, um, which is right on an area called Iceberg Alley because you can literally, or you used to be able to, it's probably different now with global warming, but you used to be able to see icebergs like just floating by. Um, and this is a picture taken of them that summer. They're all making ice cream. He's with his cousins. Sam is the dark haired boy in the middle and that's his little brother, George. Um, and they stayed there for the summer and it sort of um, was, a um, it, the whole trip impacted Sam dramatically because he was taken out of a crisis, out of a very dark, dram dramatic moment in his life and transported to um, another locale um, where he saw the Northern Lights and icebergs. And so throughout his life, he would then use travel and use um, moving from place to place as a, not only as a way to get away from pain and difficult circumstances, but as a way to engender new visions. Um, and also the trip gave him a real internal sense of space and distance um, and time, um, which he internalized. And so he came back then to um, San Mateo, went to high school, um, had a girlfriend, <laughs> went off to college at Berkeley. Um, and this is the beginning of World War II. Um, and he's at Berkeley and he is, studying um, pre-med. He has decided that he wants to do something to help mankind because he's basically feels responsible for Roy Powers' death. And also he feels guilty about the death of his mother. Um, so he's studying pre-med and then, you know, Pearl Harbor happens and Sam um, ends up enlisting in the Air Corps. Um, and so here Sam is a um, trainer in the fall of 1943. Um, he started going up in small open airplanes um, and 
up in these planes, Sam sort of internalized the vocabulary that would then become his when he became an artist. He had no ambitions at this point to be an artist, but he really fell in love with flying, with looking at the landscape from above, with light and fog and air moving through the cockpit window. He also made the decision at this point to um, become a reconnaissance pilot, which I thought was really interesting when I discovered that because it meant that he identified his role as a visual one, even before he decided to be a visual artist. So a reconnaissance pilot flies low over the land and takes photographs. Um, so that's what Sam was, was training to do when he started to get really sick. <clears throat> now, Sam always maintained that he had an airplane crash and that's how he ended up in the hospital, but he never had an airplane crash. He started to have coughs, he had pneumonia, he had fevers, he um, had back pains and it took a year and they finally diagnosed him with spinal tuberculosis. Um, so here is Sam in his hospital bed. This is in 46, he was diagnosed at the end of 44. Um, and he was really lucky because a week before he was diagnosed was the first time that they ever treated um, somebody with TB with an antibiotic. Um, and they started then to use antibiotics on um, GIs and guys in, um, in the vet hospitals because you know they were a group of sick individuals they could sort of test the treatment on. So Sam had spinal tuberculosis. They took part of his femur out and replaced part of his spine. He was encased in a plaster corset and he was literally sandwiched between two sheets in what's called a Bradford frame bed. And he was at this point that Sam was really bored. He was very, very depressed. Um, he was told he almost died, right? They didn't think he would live. Uh, he was told he might never walk again. So he couldn't, you know, he knew he would never be a doctor. Um, he basically read everything he could read. And he was given by um, one of the nurses, um, a candy striper, a set of watercolor paints. And he started to paint. And he was really good at it. Um, he just sort of had a natural hand. And I'm gonna just read you a little section, um, a couple of um, lines, um, paragraphs from this section of the book um, about when he's learning to paint. <clears throat> Given morphing for his pain, he began to hallucinate most memorably a series of visitations from an old Chinese couple. He'd been interested in East Asia while in the hospital in Santa Ana, first reading about Zen Buddhism and then learning how to meditate, then studying some Chinese. He knew how to draw characters for good morning and see you soon. When the old couple appeared to be a, to a very drug Sam, they were dressed in green and gold robes and sat hovering on a metal bar just out of reach above his head, speaking to him in their language. Even though he couldn't understand what the couple said, their presence reassured him. He liked them better than his doctors and nurses who felt he, who he felt would toss him back in the loony bin if he ever mentioned hallucinations. Aside from the old Chinese couple, Sam was very much alone and depressed. The nurses were overwhelmed with the wounded. His doctors doubted his survival and the other soldiers around him were struggling through their own recovery. Frozen in celluloid, he was just another flat horizontal object that needed care, tending, tuning, turning, feeding, and washing. At 21, he found the life he knew and the future he dreamed to be over. He would never pilot a plane. A medical career was probably out of reach too, as he couldn't walk, stand, or sit. He might never raise, rise from his Bradford bed. As he stared at the white walls and ceilings of his room, his mind began, began to unravel. He swore they bled colors. He was suffering from the mild hallucinations and fever dreams that accompany tuberculosis. His stepmother, Virginia, came to Denver to visit him. She sat beside his bed in her straw hat and read to him from the books the Red Cross ladies dropped off at his room. When he was wheeled out of one of the hospital's open porches, <clears throat> she accompanied him into the fresh air. In the distance rose the snow-covered peaks of the Rocky Mountains, above the vault of Colorado's blue sky, summits that Sam knew he couldn't explore. 
though Virginia held out hope that Sam would one day again be the eager, promising young man, Sam felt he'd become a cockroach in Kafka's metamorphosis. This might have been the end of Sam Francis, if not for two events. The first Sam never even knew about. In November 1944, the same week as his diagnosis with spinal tuberculosis, the recently discovered antibiotic streptomorphine was administered for the first time to a critically ill tuberculosis patient. The effect was immediately impressive. The disease visibly arrested. The only problem was that streptomorphine made the patient deaf. However, this experiment opened the door for the development of other antibiotics useful to treating tuberculosis, and the U.S. Veterans Administration began carrying out clinical trials in veterans hospitals. Sam would just have to live long enough to benefit from the antibiotic cure. The second event triggering the, the second event triggering the passion that sustained Sam until he received antibiotics occurred on March 7, 1945. As part of his therapy to alleviate depression and boredom, Sam was given a set of watercolors. By this time, he'd read most of the books on the carts the Red Cross ladies pushed through the ward and had begun leafing through a few art history books. Sam later divulged that his primary attraction to art books was erotic. What caught his eye and his lust were the risque reproductions of Goya's Naked Maja and Manet's Naked Olympia. Both paintings of women lying prone on couches are startling in their frank depictions of nudity and for the women's brazen gazes. With the gift of the watercolors, Sam started to paint and draw. He copied from art books, cartoons, postcards, magazines, movie posters. He tried unsuccessfully to paint the Chinese couple from his hallucinations. Eventually, he began painting remembered landscapes from his childhood. Soon he was working on his art 16 hours a day. He kept his paint jars stuffed with brushes and bottles of turpentine and the water to thin his colors and towels to dab up the excess or mistakes on his bedside tray. He hung his finished work around him, transforming his room into a studio and his nurses and aides into assistants. The kitchen staff saved egg yolks for him to use as additional binding agent, turning powdered pigment into rich, pure colors of paint. Because of his surgery, he couldn't sit propped up in bed. However, the Bradford frame allowed Sam to lie on his stomach, suspended in a cot over his mattress. From this angle, he could reach around the sides and work with his brushes and palettes on the side canvas position directly below him. Wrapped in bandages and draped in sheets, Sam hung over his created landscapes experiencing the same view from above that he'd loved as a child levitating on a seesaw and later as a young pilot unimpeded by gravity. Though no longer able to play a reconnaissance role in the war, the metal bed frame became his airplane. Miraculously, it granted him access to the same unique space, the threshold between earth and clouds, structure and vision. Immersed in his boundless topography, of his imagination, Sam was again free. Um, and so he continues to paint. He continues to paint for a year. He starts submitting his artwork to competitions and um, to be included in exhibitions. And he is visited, um, this is at Fort Miley, he's visited by the artist David Park, um, who comes to Sam. Um, and keeps continues to visit him and encourages his students to visit him and bring Sam paints and um, selects some paintings of Sam's to be in an annual exhibit and also arranges for Sam to visit, visit the Legion of Honor um, where Sam sees an El Greco and he is really moved by the El Greco and he realizes it's a painting of um, a, a one, uh, an El Greco saint holding the keys to the kingdom. And Sam realizes that art is the keys to his kingdom. And the other thing that happens is that Sam becomes convinced that it isn't antibiotics, but it's art that saves his life. And so for the rest of his life, life, death, and painting are intrinsically linked. Um, and so uh, he would also continue to carry tuberculosis throughout his life. It didn't leave his system. There was no like final cure for it and it would re reactivate. And every time he got sick again, he would you know, begin to pain again or um, try and cure himself through art. Um, so Sam goes, he marries his childhood sweetheart, Vera, the first of his five wives. And he returns to Berkeley, this time not in pre-med, but in art. 
Um, he gets his BA and MA in three years. He's um, fast tracked on the GI Bill um, to get his master's. Um, and while he's at Berkeley, he's still, you know, um, wearing a leg brace and sometimes a corset around his middle. Uh, he's still in pain. He's not really very good at attending classes. He likes to sort of just go over to San Francisco and hang around the, um, the art school there. Uh, so he doesn't really have one mentor and he sort of picks up his own visual language from different things he looks at. And this is a final painting or one of the final paintings Sim Sam did while he was at Berkeley. It's called For Fred and it's for his friend, the artist um, and teacher, Fred Martin. Um, and it sort of incorporates, it's really one of the first paintings that where Sam's own style is coming through, um, but it also incorporates the visual language he learned from Clifford Still, which is like, you know, drama on a big scale, um, the visual language he learned from looking at Rothko, um, who had been teaching across the Bay um, in San Francisco, um, because, you know, color is carrying the dynamic and the weight of the painting, and it's also those rectangular shapes. Although with Sam's style, they're more crepuscular and crescent shaped, um, and they're not so opaque, they're more liquid. Um, and he also studied with Edward Corbet, um, who did very sort of gray atmospheric paintings. And you can see um, the influence of um, Corbet uh, in this work too. Um, and as, as soon as Sam finishes at Berkeley, he, his marriage, his first marriage is already breaking up. Um, he was an extraordinarily restless individual. You know, he'd been contained basically in bed and in a corset for three years. And once he was free of that corset, he really never stopped moving for the rest of his life, except when he was ill. Um, so he leaves Berkeley. He makes this, this interesting choice not to go to New York where most of the artists at this point were congregating. Um, and he decides to go to Paris. Uh, and that was, uh, I mean, in some ways a really smart decision for Sam to make, but it really complicated his relationship with the New York art world. Um, and he goes with his girlfriend, Muriel Goodwin. He arrives in Paris in 1950. This is a picture taken a few years later. Um, that's Sam right there. Uh, this is a poet named Rachel Jacobs. Um, but he sort of arrives in Paris in 1950. Paris is recovering from, still recovering from World War II. Um, still very uh, depressed. Um, everything was really expensive. Sam and Muriel get a room at the Hotel de Seine where a lot of other American expats um, stay and their room is a dollar a day. Um, they were up on the fourth or fifth floor, I can't remember right now. Uh, and because the higher the, higher the floor, um, the cheaper the room. Um, and they were part of a very, you know, vital expat community in Paris. Um, Sam's friends were the painter Al Held, Kimber Smith, the, pa the painter Shirley Jaffe, um, the Canadian painter Jean-Paul Riappel, and later Joan Mitchell, who came in 1955. Um, so he, they are in the Hotel de Seine, and in this teeny, teeny room, the room was about 10 by 10 feet, um, it had a bed, it had a sink, it had a bidet, and it had a window, um, and that's it. And Sam started doing these all white paintings. Now they're not completely white because they have little bits of color in them, but they're called the white series. Um, he said that he, they came out of sort of a sense of, of poverty, um, in the sense that he, you know, he was on the GI Bill, but he really could only afford um, white paint, so he mostly used white paint. Um, he has to make these paintings, they're pretty large paintings, and he, because the room is so teeny, he makes them um, a little bit at a time. So he keeps his canvases rolled up under his bed and he unrolls them and paints a little bit at a time by setting the canvas up over on the sink, which he uses as his easel, which is against a window. Um, and Sam said of these paintings that the, what he thought white was the space between things. And he really meant the space, sort of an electric energy feel, field between everything. Um, but the white in the paintings also have to do with 
what he had stared at for those three years in the hospital, which was the ceiling. Um, so, you know, he was staring at white until it literally bled color. So he's painting th this visual experience that he had looked at. Also, you can see that they're influenced by Corbet, Edward Corbet, who had been his teacher um, at Berkeley, who was also doing very sort of gray atmospheric um, all over canvases. Um, and they're also, you know, Sam said they started by accident. He said that he had been gessoing his canvas. So he was, you know, applying rabbit's eye glue and then sanding it and, and gessoing it. And he noticed that there was a drip of paint from the gesso in the middle of the canvas that looked to him like skin. Um, and so skin is also the space between things, right? It separates our soul from, from every from the world from keeps our, our soul within our, within ourselves so and the skin is also a canvas right a canvas is the skin that separates the artist from the viewer so sam was painting literally painting skins um and so he becomes immediately he starts showing these paintings they're done in 50 and 51 and he immediately gets recognition early on for doing these paintings they kind of hit paris um, at a time when it really needed something. Um, and they sort of connect to what the pre-war Paris um, works of, and later on you'll see this even more, um, he incorporates the sort of um, modernist pre-war work of Monet in particular with what was happening on the East Coast in New York. Um, from white, he goes to black. So Sam loved contradictions. Um, and he said black was a way of going back towards the light. Um, you can see on this one on the right um, that there's a band of colored light crackling through um, on the bottom of the black. It's also interesting to note that Sam was in Saint-Germain-des-Prés and he was right near the Gothic cathedrals and he was really influenced um, and fell in love with all the stained glass windows. And you know, in, in a stained glass window, there, there's a lot of darkness, a lot of lead work that separates um, these bright areas of color. Um, from This is a picture of Sam and Muriel who became in 1955, his second wife, Muriel Goodwin. They went back to America, um, got married and Sam started to make inroads into the New York world. But in this point, you know, it, it was a real, it was very problematic. Although he got a gallery in New York, he was already famous in um, Paris and um, the art critic Paul Schimmel said that Sam made an end run around um, the New York school painters by bringing the vocabulary of abstract expressionism to Europe, but filtered through the lens of California. Um, so it complicated his relationship with New York, which was at this point competing with Paris, probably at this point had overtaken Paris um, for um, being the center of the art world. Um, so when Sam showed up in New York, they were like, who are you? You know, you're, are you American or are you European? Are you West Coast or are you East Coast? They didn't really know where to place him. Um, and he, he'd made an end run around them. He'd kind of, you know, gone ahead of them and gone to Europe. Um, and so there was a lot of jealousy and he was also making money, um, which certainly in New York was frowned upon. Um, if you were commercial, you were a sellout. Uh, so he goes back to um, France and he, this is from a little bit earlier, he, um, after he did the white series and the black series, he just did these all over color um, paintings. Again, there's other colors in here, but it's mostly a red canvas. Sam said, <clears throat> especially in the beginning that he approached color um, one color at a time because color was so intense to him. It felt like a tiger in a jungle and it had to be approached carefully. So he would really immerse himself in just, just getting to know one color. Um, this piece, Big Red, hangs, or it used to hang, in, it belongs to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. If you, you know, if you're familiar with Matisse's Red Studio, you can see the real influence of Matisse. Also, Rothko in the early 50s was also working on large rectangular spaces of red color. Um, and again, you see the like the the, the liquid shapes. And especially here of Monet, Sam had gone to um, see the late Monet work, the water lilies, 
Um, and you could really see him struggling and, and incorporating this vocabulary um, of Monet into you know, um, a more abstract color field type of painting. Um, this painting was done right after he left New York and came back to uh, Paris. And he, for the first time, flew over the Atlantic in a Pan Am flight. So it was before he had always traveled by boat and this was the first tra transatlantic flight he ever took. Um, and so you can see it's very much of a, of a landscape, abstract landscape with um, the color bordering this open colored sea area, um, land masses on either side. Um, it's also a painting about heaven and earth. Um, the color represents earth and um, the painting's title in lovely, Blueness references a poem by uh, the romantic um, German poet Holender, and it's really about how how do we connect heaven and earth, and what is the measure for connecting heaven and earth? And that measure, of course, is the blue space of the of heaven of the sky, of the space between things. Um, so Sam went back to Paris. He has his New York show. Um, it sells well, but he doesn't get really great reviews in New York because um, New York thinks that Sam is, his hand is too much like Matisse. He's too refined um, a painter. Sam's work is more sensual and symphonic than what was happening in New York at that time with the New York school. That work was much more, was darker and more muscular. And Sam's had, he was a virtuoso. I mean, he literally picked up a paintbrush and painted. And it's not that he didn't struggle, but he had this very lyrical light hand. And it just, it was just his. He just, he didn't have to struggle for it. He just had it. And uh, so he's back in Europe. His marriage, his second marriage to Muriel is breaking up. And he starts doing one of my favorite paintings of all time. Um, it's called the Basel Mural Triptych. Um, it was a triptych. Uh, he did it for Basel, um, um, the Kunsthalle of Basel, the cultural center in Basel. Um, that's one of the panels that's left. It's in the Pasadena Art Museum. You can really see this, the painting is opening up. It almost has these Baroque shapes. It's almost like clouds parting. Um, and there's this white space that becomes really important in, to San Francis and, and to his whole art and aesthetic. Um, here is the only photograph we have of it, um, black and white photograph of it, um, all, all three panels, because one of the panels was destroyed, so there are only two left. Um, at this point, Sam is really frust getting frustrated with Paris. He is feeling like he's outgrown Paris, and he's, you know, his marriage is breaking up, and even the pain is opening up, and he's just really restless. And so he um, gets a commission to go to Japan, um, and paints um, the Tokyo mural, which is behind him. It's a very blue mural. Again, you can see the white space in the middle of it. Um, and he arrives in Tokyo in 1957. Um, and he becomes, again, instantly, as he did in, in Paris, instant, instant, instantly accepted, instantly renowned. Um, the Japanese love Sam. They feel an affinity for what he's doing in his work with his open space. Sam feels an affinity for Japan. He, saw, he said he felt a deja vu when he arrived in Tokyo. He really loved the light of Japan. He loved the way of life in Japan. Um, he stays there for quite a number of months. Um, and at this point, Japan is really trying to open its art world back up into the, to the Western world after the war. So it's a real opportune moment for Sam to arrive, both for the Japanese and for, for Sam. When he leaves Japan, he starts doing paintings that, again, have what a lot of people call ma, which is this um, dramatic white space um, that sort of uh, ma is a Japanese term. And it's really the idea that um, empty space is not empty. Empty space is potent. And um, an analogy is would be like ma is the breath in uh, a line, um, a a strand of music or a pause in a line of poetry. It's that pregnant pause. It's the space that defines, the empty space 
that defines form without which the form would have no power and meaning. Um, so Sam really begins to incorporate these ideas into his artwork. This is a piece he did, um, a whole series he did on Moby Dick. Um, and after he came back from Japan, a lot of these paintings were sometimes begun in Paris. He left and he would re return to Paris and finish them. Some were done in Paris and New York. So Sam begins to start shipping paintings as he's moving around the world. On his way back from Japan, he went around the globe for the first time. He literally would continue to go around the globe many times throughout his life. Um, again, also like many of the abstract expressionists, Moby Dick was this idea of um, that they sort of incorporated it into their work um, of the search for form in, um, uh, in the white canvas. And Sam said that, you know, my brush is my harpoon. And he would say, you know, that when he began to paint, he would feel a suction and a depression almost until he could pull the form out. So there's this idea of him pulling the form out of the white void. Um, Sam comes back to New York and he is included in the New American Painting Show, which is a big show that goes to seven countries in Europe. And he's um, the youngest, this is Sam over here. Um, this is Barnett Newman. Um, this is Theodore Stamos. Um, so he's the youngest painter in this group. He's also the only one who was um, an expat living abroad. Um, and actually also Rothko is not in this photograph. He was in this show. Um, so it was de Kooning. Um, it traveled from the Museum of Art around the world in conjunction with another show of Jackson Pollock's that went with it. Um, and Pollock had just died. Uh, so he's at this point, Sam is thinking, oh, he'll have a career in New York. Um, and he gets a studio there and um, like the biggest studio anybody's ever seen because he's making a lot of money. But again, New York doesn't know what to do with Sam because A, he's making money. B, he's, you know, what it, again, is he has this big career in Europe, but they don't really know him in America uh, or especially on the East Coast. And they're not sure where to place him. Is he a first generation artist or a second generation artist? Um, and he has, you know, not only has he had a career in Europe at this point, but he also now has a career in Japan. Um, and New York at that point was somewhat um, provincial in the sense that anything that happened across the Hudson River was considered the hinterlands or not part of the New York world. Um, and Sam was, was an internationalist at heart. And he writes in his journal at this time and, and a letter back to Franz Meyer, who was his patron in Europe, that he, in New York, he feels like a fugitive. Um, but he's doing these paintings with these beautiful open centers. And this is one of them from that time. It's one of my favorites. It's called Shining Black. And it has this white space that kind of moves like a waterfall right through the middle of the painting. Um, and then the other thing that's really interesting to note is these shapes along the side, and Sam uses them a lot, are very much like the spinal column. Um, and a lot of Sam's work incorporates the body, you know, that he has and continues to have this injured spine and has problems with his back. He gets married a third time, has a child, and then takes off around the world again and ends up back in the hospital in Switzerland. Um, exhausted uh, and with a reoccurrence of tuberculosis. Uh, there's Sam in bed. Um, again, they think he's gonna die. At this point, he has um, testicular tuberculosis. Um, and right before he got sick, he had started doing um, the early versions of what we, we call the blue ball series, which are these blue balls, um, very optical paintings. Um, that he continues to do after he's in the hospital and when he comes out. And Sam really thinks of them as a premonition to his illness. And again, he's really identifying um, art with life and death and art as this thing that gives him a premonition to what's going on with himself physically, but also as a healing um, enterprise in his life. Um, and it, while he's in the hospital, he starts reading. He had read Jung before, but he's really um, gets involved in reading Jung and 
believes that in order to heal himself physically, he needs to consolidate his whole being and all the yins and yangs, um, what Jung calls the anima and the animas um, of his psyche. Now, what's interesting to me about these paintings um, and other people I've written about is they have a lot to do with Matisse's Blue Nude, which had been done in 1952. And this is a Klein, by the way, Eve Klein was also experimenting with um, blue nude forms. Uh, in Sam's Blue Nudes, if you wanna call them Blue Nudes, the body is reduced to the genitals. Um, and they're also not just one nude body figure. They're these commingled um, genital um, shapes um, that he's working with and playing with. Um, they're also, and this is what else happens to him in, in this period in the hospital, he's again forced to be work from bed. Uh, so he repositions himself over the canvas. Um, and so from now on, and there are a couple little drips here, but from now on, the canvas is always below Sam. So before it was vertical, after, you know, and from now on, it's below him. Um, and he hovers above it and works on paintings from above. And so again, that's why these paintings are so optical because he, they, weren't, they weren't upright, they were below him. Um, he gets out of the hospital and this is when Sam returns to California. His doctors tell him he really needs to stop moving around so much and settle down and live in a warm climate. Um, and so he goes to Santa Monica um, and he stops painting for a while. He um, says that this is a series he does when he eventually starts painting again, but he said that the, the blue forms that he had been painting started to move further and further to the edges of the canvas. And he really didn't know what was gonna be on the canvas. It was like the audience was, or his, his actors were leaving the stage and he just didn't know what was gonna be there. So he devotes himself to printing. Um, he becomes one of the early printers that helped with the print Renaissance in, in this country. Um, he was a master printer um, and he would do prints for the rest of his life. Um, and again, the print, a print is, an, especially on a lithography stone, it's below, below you. So he's again repositioning himself and working on images below him. And whereas a painting is something more spontaneous um, or intuitive, I would say, with a print, Sam had to think it out in reverse. So he had to really think through the process and that educated his paintings too when he came back to them. Um, when he does begin to paint again, he's at this point he's established um, a compound in Santa Monica and has a studio in Ocean Park. Uh, he's married again for the fourth time to a woman named Mako Irumitsu. Um, and he begins doing what are called the edge series. And these are some a series of paintings that some people have a really hard time with because they are so reduced. Um, but what's really interesting, and again, this is where Sam's contradictions come into play, um, is that the white surface in the painting is the most painted part of the painting. He does those white layers, gessos and paints them with tinted white paint, um, maybe seven times um, and they're sanded. And then the color bands were put on at the end. So the white is the most painted surface of the painting. Um, and again, it's that idea of ma of potent um, space. Uh, and Sam said of these paintings that the white of these paintings is different than the first white series he did because where those were diffused and sort of um, foggy and atmospheric, these are very, very reflective. Um, surfaces. And of these paintings, Sam said the white uh, in the center is reserved for you. So it was a way of inviting the viewer into the space of the painting. Um, and he also has these other huge ambitions. Um, just wanted to show you a picture of Sam at this point in his life. He's about 40 years old. That's maybe 43 there. That's Mako, his fourth wife, and his sons, Osama and um, um, Shingo. Um, and that's in his Tokyo studio. So at this point, Sam has um, studios in Santa Monica, Ocean Park. He has kept his studio in Paris. He still um, was using a studio in New York City. He had a carriage house in Switzerland where he worked when he was in Switzerland because his major dealer was Eberhard Cornfield in Switzerland. And he had a studio in Tokyo. 
so he's constantly moving around the world when he he you know he'll just up one day and tell Mako oh I'm I'm going to Paris and packs a suitcase and goes and his paintings are he has many assistants his canvases are co constantly being rolled up and he'll start them in one studio and finish them in another um, and so there are all these really interesting mutant strains that Sam picks up and that influence his body of work because he's constantly moving around and sort of opening himself up to different places. He also, um, just like he sort of refused to be tied to a single woman, he refused to be tied to a single gallery, which um, now may be more common, but then was sort of unheard of. Um, and he starts what's called the Litho Shop, which is his, his, his own company that runs his business. Um, and he, um, you know, he's very much in charge of his own life. He's printing, he has a printing press um, um, in where he's working, his own lithographer. Um, and so he's basically becoming an industry. He has, when he arrived in California, he was the most famous artist they had in the area. Um, and Ed Moucher actually worked as his assistant and remembers Sam and said that Sam brought you know, he brought um, sort of refinement to the whole enterprise of being an artist. He sort of brought um, LA and put it on the map. Um, this is Sam with Judy Chicago. I just adore this picture because they, they look like such <laughs> old hippies. Um, but they're at a happening that um, Judy Chicago put on. There's Sam with his love beads and they're looking up into the distance because at this point, Sam and James Terrell and Judy Chicago were doing smoke shows of color, billowing colored smoke. They're looking at um, two little um, model airplanes that Terrell and Sam had sent up into the air, which did not go off. They didn't fire smoke. But a few years earlier, Sam had done a similar show in Tokyo. Um, these were a bunch of um, planes that he, um, there's a helicopter right in the middle. Sam's in the helicopter. And these are sort of these elite pilots flying these planes um, over Tokyo Bay, shooting colored smoke. Um, so Sam had these really grand ambitions. He basically wanted to paint the heavens. Um, also the earth, <laughs> he, uh, this is also in Tokyo where he had these skiers shooting colored smoke and the canvas, again, the white canvas space is the snow. Um, at this point, Sam gets a commission to do this painting for um, Berlin and it's called Berlin Red and it's the single largest canvas in the world. Um, so he just, he wanted to, he had like endless desire. Sam once wrote in his journal, what do I like most about myself? I love my desire, I love desire itself. And so he, this, his desire wasn't, it was, you know, for the biggest thing for he had, um, an assistant who made his own paints and he patented his own colors. Uh, so it was for bigger and for grander and for also just reach. I mean, he, he had just this passionate reach. Um, that's the Sam painting one section of Berlin Red. Uh, he liked to paint in his underwear. Interestingly enough, when I looked at a bunch of photographs of Sam painting, um, again, he's walking all over the surface of the painting. His clothes would oh would, like there's you see the red boxer shorts and his blue socks and his red shirt they often match the color palette um, which I thought was fun um, this is a series that Sam did uh, after um, the edge series um, they're the what are they called the matrix series um, and again he did these on the floor by dispersing bands of water onto the canvas through with long rollers and then walking and um, releasing paint, flinging paint into these bands of color. And what's interesting about these paintings is that they sort of incorporate the um, grid format of Modrian with, in, and within that grid format is this kind of spontaneity and chaos and freedom of something like Jackson Pollock. So Sam, again, these were contradictions. He, he loved both um, form and its opposite, chaos. Um, and um, a white canvas was all about a way for him to contain chaos. Uh, this is Sam looking down on his canvases when he was, he, you know, he had these vast studios. He had a cherry picker in one studio so he could get up high and look down. Um, and there he's on a ladder. He, Sam uh, was, also, again, with his ambition, he, he part of his great ambition was to put LA 
on the map as the vital art center. So he was one of the people instrumental with the Museum of Contemporary Art, establishing it in LA. Um, he also established a publishing company that is still in operation today called Lapis Press. Um, he also at this time started, um, produced a Jungian film, the first documentary on Jung. He started a wind turbine company for alternative energy, a reforestation program and an um, alternative medical research center. So he had these very philanthropic um, desires and, and really uh, this energy to do, to do more than just be an artist, which I found fascinating. This is Sam getting married for the fifth time to a woman named Margaret Smith. And I'm pretty much gonna wrap it up here. They ended up buying a lot of property in Point Reyes. And I'm not really gonna tell you what happened, but um, so you can find out if you read the book. Um, but uh, it was sort of a very tragic end to his very big life. And I'm gonna stop sharing now and come back. Wow. So I have read the book, all 300 pages, plus the acknowledgments and the, uh, no, not all the notes, but uh, so I do highly recommend it to people because the 45 minutes or so you've been able to spend here are just a mere fraction of yeah. all the information that you can yeah. find. He so, had a really, really big life. I oh, mean, yeah. that was actually what really attracted me to him because a lot of artists, for better or worse, they go into the studio and paint and their life is very interior. And Sam's was just, you know, he had this global life. Yes, so as if, so if people have questions, you start typing it into the Q and A. And while you're doing that, I have a few. Um, okay. So if there were audience members who were interested in seeing some of Sam's work, do they oh. need to wait for an exhibition or are there any no. regular display? Yeah. SF MoMA has, oh, you almost always has one up. Um, they, I think the last time I was there, they had three. Anderson Collection down at Stanford has some. Berkeley Museum has quite a few because Sam gifted them um, to Berkeley. Uh, he, you know, he actually was the second artist to ever get uh, an honorary PhD. Um, so from Berkeley, um, so, you know, and then LACMA in L LA and MOCA in LA and, you know, there, yeah, there's a gallery in Mill Valley that Robert Green that almost always has some Francis Prince. I mean, you know, it's like you can see them everywhere. <laughs> okay. So in the uh, notes, you mentioned that there are two movies. Uh, one, hmm. the, the painter Sam Francis, uh, a 2008 yes. Body and Soul Productions, and then a 1975 one, Sam Francis by Michael Blackwood yeah. Productions. If people were, interested in that um well i i think you know about seeing those um both are documentaries uh they're both interesting films um i think you might have to pay to to, to rent them but really what's interesting now is there's a very short documentary i think it's about 45 minutes or 30 minutes that the 18th street project in santa monica just did um, about Sam and his influence in Santa Monica. So I think that one is free to see. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, just check Those were out. really great things for me to see too, because it's really wonderful to be able to see. I mean, I saw Sam Payne a little bit when I was young, but um, footage of him working, because he's just, you know, he, it was really the only time where he wasn't in pain where, when he was right. walking across the canvas and in the canvas. And he really walked across that canvas like it was a landscape. Like he was, it was hills and valleys and, and he was bringing the image forth. Okay, there is a question here. Uh, audience member says, I have a beautiful painting by Margaret Smith, the widow oh. of Sam Francis. Do you know if she was, if she is still painting or where she is? Margaret lives in England. Um, I did interview her. Uh, that's interesting. So I'm curious about if that person knew Margaret, but um, I don't know if she's still painting. I, I know, I don't know because she did have a stroke a few years ago. So I don't know if she's able to paint. Okay. Um, during Sam's final years when he was in declining health, did he have any personal reflections on different phases of his artistic career? 
what he might thought were some of his best works or enjoyed creating the most or found most challenging? Um, you know, I think like any artist, what he was doing at the moment really interested him. He did go back and revisit certain periods of his work. So there are some blue balls that he did or different colored balls actually that he did later on. Um, I think also there was a certain period of his work that sold more like the early um, Parisian paintings, the ones he did in Paris. Um, so that would have probably annoy him, but he was really, you know, he was, he was again reinventing himself when he got sick um, at the end of his life and trying to bring it all in. And, and I think he really enjoyed that. So I think he was always, I mean, Sam was always about, um, at, he was additive um, and, uh, so he, he was expansive by nature. So he was always trying to expand into new areas. Um, and I think that's the interesting thing about his paintings because he looked at all his paintings as a continuum. So one painting led into another painting led into another painting. So they're all really one body of work in a sense. So in view of the large number of people and original material you had access to, what was your process for deciding what to include and not include in this book. Oh, well, I, sure I, include, was... I mean, it was based on Sam's life. So that Sam was my, my you know, um, focal point. And uh, so, I, it, you know, I, I guess also because I had to tell such a big story in a limited space, right? You know, 300 and some pages was right. the contract for the book. So I, it wasn't gonna be a 700 page door stopper. Um, I know, yeah, you know, I, that wasn't the book I set out to write. So uh, some areas I did, I touched on briefly, like I only touched on the whole Lapis Press endeavor where he did start this publishing company and wanted to do fine art books, but also literary books and Phil, you know, he did a book on philosophy. I mean, he would, he was, he was the publisher. And so, you know, these were books from all over the world, translations, and I didn't really get to go into all the details on that. Um, so I, I, my grounding was Sam. And um, I mean, there were a lot of journals and there were a lot of, especially early on his, his letters um, from, from, you know, from his childhood and from when he went, first went off to Europe to his father, you know, they were a real basis for a lot of my, mm -hmm. my work. And then also because Sam was such a myth maker and, <laughs> you know, fabricator, um, if I, I, I wanted to be able to prove something, so I would have to have a number of sources. So oh, yes. if it was, you know, or if it was really a myth, then, I mean, it was interesting to understand why the myth. Okay. So there was obviously Sam Francis, the artist, but what about Sam Francis, what I would might call the business or the organization, especially yeah. as time went on, he had more aspects involved in more aspects of the art world, acquired more property, and had what seemed like an ever expanding support system of employees, vendors, advisors, and the like. Who managed all that? Nancy Moser. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he, you know, he had he had an accountant uh, who did some not so great things. Um, and he had um, his sort of curator assistant, Nancy, who worked for him for a number of years. He had some assistants who worked for him for over 20 years. Um, but everybody worked at the whim of Sam Francis. So it was all on his schedule. It was um, all about his dream and his ambition. But for, you know, for instance, Lapis Press had its own person who was running it. I mean, certain, certain areas, you know, he turned over to other people. Um, wind Harvest was, he did that in conjunction with some people from his Jungian that's this wind turbine company, the first vertical access wind turbine company in America. Um, he did that with some people from his Jungian psychology group. Um, so yeah, I mean, Sam, had, you know, he, he had a good business sense. Okay, so um, I'm not seeing more questions. Are you seeing any, Jeff? I am not, okay. but I, I have one that's rather tangential. Um, it seems like this, this story of artists getting sick and then having an illness affect their career is not new. No, Frida Kahlo. I wonder if anyone has ever chronicled that. I'm, I'm a physician. That's the only reason I focused yeah, I in think on that. There, 
I think how, have... how did health issues, you know, reframe this, the story of various artists over the years? Well, especially a lot of writers. Like I think Robert Louis Stevenson was sick early on in his life. So, I mean, it doesn't, especially a kind of illness, like, I mean, Frida Kahlo was really sick and in pain, but TB, once you're over the hard part, my mom was to tuberculosis, had to, was tubercular, uh, you know, you're mildly ill, but you're not, you know, you have a lot of free time in bed and that can be really creative and focus you. So I, I, I did read a bunch of books on illness and creativity um, and different kinds of illnesses and creativity. I mean, there was a whole idea of especially the tubercular artist, you know, right in, in 19th century Europe, that kind of pale person who was really creative and mostly writers. Um, I think of Thomas Mann, you know, <laughs> so yeah, I think it, mm. you know, it sort of allows you that, that time and that time also away from the rest of the world um, almost like a hibernation where you can pretty much be self-taught and you can really come out with some original work. And the medications in some cases may help you hallucinate. Yeah, you well, even he, more creative. He, uh, he was only on morphine in the very beginning because um, I got hold of his medical records and he was really, I mean, Sam tried drugs, but he was not, you know, after that, he was, he was not a drinker. He was not a, you know, one of those drug taking artists. And that actually ended up hurting him at the end of his life because he refused traditional medical treatment. Mm -hmm. No, I think we've um, reached our hour or slightly after, and uh, I think this has been a wonderful presentation. Thank you. A and I encourage the art lovers out there to uh, go out and uh, buy and read your book uh, or take it out from the library because uh, I'm sure they will all find it very informative and enjoyable. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to, to be on. Yes, Take thank you. Thank you for appearing <laughs> and sharing your knowledge. Yeah, thank you. And right. thank you everybody for listening. Thank you.